Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, this session, I just have to give you a short intro because I gave it last week in Atlanta at DevNexus and it was 180 slides in 60 minutes. So it's so much stuff. And now we do it in 40, okay? Are you ready? <laughs> just let, let's get started. So uh, Trash Talk, yeah, it's about garbage collection and memory management. My name is Gerrit Grunwald. I'm working for Azul. We do JVMs and also garbage collectors. I also run a Java user group in Münster. I'm from Germany. And um, yeah, let's get started. Memory management in the JVM um, is automatic, right? So why care? Who cares about garbage collection here in the room? OK, good. Who is a garbage collection expert here in the room? If yes, then just leave, because you know more than me. So memory management is important because it has really an impact on the application performance, on the responsiveness of your application, and also on the system requirements when you run your application, right? So this is how it works in the JVM in a very simple schema. So we have the stack, which is it's bound to threads. So every thread has its own stack frame. And there we have primitives and references, right? And it's growing and shrinking automatically. And this is local access, so this is thread safe. Then we have the heap. There we have the objects. The heap is usually big, right? And this has shared access, so it's not thread safe and it needs garbage collection. And then we have the meta space, which contains all kinds of class information, like class metadata and so on. Everything that's needed for the JVM to work with classes, this is in the meta space. We just mainly look at the heap at the heap here because that's where the garbage collection stuff happens. So if we take a look at this code, I hope it's readable, uh, pretty simple. We just have a couple of uh, classes here that are objects that we reference from the person record. And let's take a look how this looks when we put it on the stack and on the heap. So in the stack, there is a stack frame created for this main method. And you see the references for the person P1 to P4 and also for the list of persons, right? In the heap, it looks like this. So we have the actual objects in the heap for all of those. And they point, for example, the list points also with references to these persons because they are part of that. If I now, for example, so they are all reachable from the stack, right? So if I now, for example, set the P1 to null, then there is no direct connection from the stack anymore to this object, but it's still reachable through the list. So if you try this system out print line, from the list, you will get the Garrett there, even if you set it to zero before, or to, to null, not to zero, sorry. So it's, um, that gives you an idea how that works. And when I remove the list and set it also to null, then there is no link to these objects anymore, and then we end up with garbage that has to be taken away. Only these three objects are reachable from the stack, and the rest is just lying around in the heap and consumes space. That leads me to garbage collection. So we have to get rid of this garbage somehow, and there are different strategies. And um, garbage collection, of all, first of all, is automatic. It's a kind of automatic memory management. There's other stuff like automatic, uh, automatic uh, resource uh, reference counting, which is uh, used, for example, in Swift and other languages. Um, it identifies and reclaims no longer used memories and ensures efficient memory utilization. But the biggest part is it frees the user from managing the memory manually, right? So in C, C++, you have to do that manually, the malloc and free stuff. This is done by the garbage collection here. And we can separate this in, in three phases. And the, the phases are, first of all, it's tracing. So we try to identify live objects on the heap, so the stuff that's still in use. And then we have to free the things that are not in use anymore, so the garbage, literally. And then we have to compact, so we have to move things around to make it more compact, right? Because we don't want to have the cluttered heap. But uh, I will go to that. So let's, if we take a look at tracing, then it means we traverse the graph from the frame, from the roots, the GC roots, and search for all the references to the live objects, right? So this is the tracing. And um, then we mark them as reachable. Right? So that's the live objects. And then we have freeing. Freeing means we have to go through all the memory areas and scan them. And like, like, are you free? Are you used? Are you not used? And then mark them as, uh, as not live. Right? We clear the unmarked objects. We mark them first, then we clear them. And then we remove the, the marked bits from the live objects, and then we start again. So this is the, the idea behind the freeing stuff. And then we have the compaction 
where we have moving things around, and there are two different ways of compaction. So there's moving, that means we have one big heap, and then we move objects to one side and line them up and like nicely, right? This is moving, and then we have copy. Copy is, it's similar, but there we have two memory areas where we have one is filling up, and when it's full, we just move all the live stuff to the other one, and then we free the first one. That's copy, right? So it's, it's similar, but I have demos to show you how it works. Um, one thing that comes with compaction is if we move objects on the heap, I, saw you, I showed you this, these pointers, the references, somehow we have to update the pointers, we have to remap them, right? Which is an additional phase that, that comes with moving collectors. And it takes time, of course, we have to update all the references. So that means this is the original reference, we move the object on the heap somewhere else, and then we have to update the reference to the new one, so, because otherwise we won't find it anymore. Okay. Collectors. This is not the actual garbage collectors that we have in the JVM. This is the principal garbage collection, um, let's say, algorithms that are available. And first of all, we start with a non-moving collector. So there's nothing moved around. We just mark the stuff, then we sweep it. Sweeping means freeing, right? So then I created a little demo for that. And you see these blue areas. This is referenced objects, live objects. And at some point when they're not used anymore, they become purple. So they're dereferenced, more or less dead. And then you see they have this little tiny red uh, square on the upper left corner. Then they are marked. That means we trace the graph and then we find, oh, they are alive. We mark them. And if you see a number in there, that means it survived a garbage collection, right? It was, it's older than the first generation. So, and this is how the, the demo here works. So we allocate stuff when we run out of memory. Then we mark all the live cells, and then we free the, de the, uh, the dead cells, unmark, and then we continue, right? So let's take a look at that. So we collect, and you see stuff is dying, so it's not used anymore. And at one point, we reach the end of the heap. We, are, we run out of memory. We need a garbage collection, so we stop the world to do that, because then we, we need some time, and here we go. So, so we stop it, we mark it, and then unmark, and then we start again. Right? So this is like mark and sweep. You see, and you already see what happens. It, it, who knows Windows, the old versions? Who knows disk fragmentation? This is exactly the same. Right? So we get a really fragmented heap here. Because now it gets harder and harder to find free areas in the heap for objects to allocate. That means allocation rate is lower if we do it like this. Okay? So this is mark and sweep, very simple. I mean, it's a simple collector, it uses the tracing algorithm, marking phase is sweet, is cheap, so it's not really a big deal. And because we don't move stuff, it's more or less fast. Um, but it leads to heap fragmentation, as we saw. Okay? So this is mark and sweep, simple. Then we have come to the moving collectors. The moving collectors, remember, was moving and copying. These two parts are available. So the moving one is the compacting collector. This is pretty much the same that we saw before, but now instead of just remove stuff, we add an additional compaction step. So let's take a look at that. So we allocate things, the heap will run out of, out of memory, you see all the purple cells that are dead, right, that have to be, has to be removed, and then we mark them, we remove the other stuff, and then we compact it. So marking, removing, compacting, right, and then we start again. Now it's way easier to allocate because we always start with a free area in front of us, right? We can fast allocate. We don't have to look for free spaces. So this is compaction. And you see it's just one heap. We have to work in one heap. And we leave some space at the end before we do. We don't fill it up completely. We need some headroom because if we need to copy things around, we need some spare space where we can copy objects to do the compaction. All right. It's faster allocation, as we saw, which is obvious, because we have the compaction. It's, again, tracing. Marking is also very cheap here. It's the same uh, mechanism. We need some headroom for the copy process, to, for the compaction process. So that need, means we need more heap than we really actually need for the application. And we eliminate the fragmentation here. That's done. That's cool. OK. But still, there is room for improvement. Let's take a look at the copy collector. That's mark and copy. And you will directly see the difference. We have two areas. It's not one big heap anymore. 
If two areas were the same size, and you see in the bottom there's a to space and a from space, right? And what it does is it, it starts allocating in the to space, and once we run out of memory in the to space, we switch the spaces, to becomes from, from becomes to, and then we copy all the live objects in the other one, in the to space now, and then because we copied them over, everything that's still in the, in the former to space, now in the from space, is garbage. We can directly wipe it out, right? This is the idea behind the copy collector. Let's take a look how this works. So we start allocating and stuff is dying. So when this area runs out of memory, we need to mark it, copy, and then free, right? That's the idea. So now we'll see. Okay, stop, mark, free, Come, now it's free. And then again, we start on this side and then if it's full, we toggle again the two spaces, move the stuff to the other side that's still alive. And you see the numbers should increase. I hope I, yes, you see now it's two because these objects with the two survive two cycles, right? In the garbage collection cycle here. And this goes on and on. So this is the idea behind the copy collector. You can directly see what's the disadvantage here, right? Because suddenly we need twice as much memory for application to be able to do that. And the other disadvantage is if we have old objects that really live for a long time, we have to copy them every time back and forth, right? So if you have a, an object that spans for the whole lifetime of your application, it will be copied every time with every cycle. So that means we have really fast sequential allocation because it's always compacted, right, which is nice. We don't have any fragmentation, that's very cool. Um, it's easier to implement than mark and sweep or mark and compact because we don't have to scan for the, for the sweeping, right? We have to scan the whole memory area. Here we know everything that's live and we copy to the other place. Now the rest is garbage. We can directly wipe out the whole space. We don't have to check. But it needs twice as much memory. That's the drawback. And long living objects need to be copied every time, right? Okay. It performs more garbage collection cycles because we have smaller heap spaces. We have to copy them all the time. So that's just also another drawback. But this is the, the third one that I would like to show you. Now we come to generational collection. And this is a different thing. Uh, we will take a look at generational mark and compact, right? And this is now a combination of the stuff that I showed you before. And for that, we have to take a look at the regenerational hypothesis. So what it means is most objects die young. This is not only in Java, this is in general in all languages. Scientists fi figured out that objects that are created, most of the objects die very quickly and just a few objects live for a longer time. So there's this kind of chart where you see the short living objects, it's the most amount of objects and then we have some medium living and then we have the long living, that's not so many, okay? If we now structure the heap using all the technologies that I showed you according to this behavior, then we can do something like that. So we take the first, where we have the most objects created and dying, that's the Eden space, right? Objects will be created there. Because they die fast, there's not a lot of stuff to do with the garbage collection cycle. Then for the medium living, we, we use a copy collector, right? So we copy just the medium living, we're copying them from time to time when the, each space fills up. And then there is some kind of a threshold that means objects that live for a long time, they will then copy it or promote it to the turnout space, which is the blue one, the old space. You directly see the advantage because long living objects don't have to be copied all the time because you copy them for some time and when they survive, that's the survivor spaces, then they will get into the promoted into the to nerd space, which is the old generation in this. This is the reason why we talk about generations. We have different generations here. And usually the Eden and the survivor spaces, this is the so-called young generation. Then we have the blue area, the two space. This is the old generation. And if we talk about minor collections, then this is the young generation collection. Mayor collections is the old generation. And if someone talks about full collection, then it means it's both, right? We have a full collection means minor and mayor collection. Okay. And you see the chart in there. So it's really tailored to this to this behavior. And I have a little demo for you to show you how it works. It's a little bit smaller, but the idea is clear. We allocate in the yellow one in the left space in Eden. Then we, if live objects survive, we copy them in the two space until the two space fills up and then we toggle between to and from. And then 
objects in this demo, they are older than three generations, will be promoted to the old generation. That's the idea. So let's take a look at that. Oh, come on, go back. Oh, damn it. Go, go. Sorry for that. My clicker doesn't always work. Come on. Okay. And check. Should start. Ah, here we go. So it starts collecting. Eden space is full. We mark the live objects, copy them to the two space, and then free it and continue. That's the idea, right? And then we continue with this cycle until we have objects that are older than three generations, and then they will be promoted into the old generation. This is how it works uh, in this generational collector. And then I will do fast forward. Now you will see the three ones will be promoted, and now it goes fast forward through the whole, and you see the automatic compaction in the survivor spaces, and you see there's some kind of a wave front moving through the heap, right? Because objects die, even the older ones die at some point. And at one point, the heap is full. So now the old generation needs a different strategy here. So what we now do is we mark them, free the heap, compact, and then we copy everything from the young generation also to the, to the generate space. You will see now, compact, copy everything over, and now we can start from scratch again. This is how generational mark and compact works. This is already a little bit complex, and this is still super simple. I hope you could follow, because this is all the basics that you need to understand how garbage collection works. And um, this is focusing on the young generation, because objects die fast, right? So, which is great. So because the young generation dies very quickly, it's just a few objects we need to copy to the survivor spaces until they fill up, and then we move the older objects, we promote them to the heap, uh, to the old generation. So that's the promotion. If it happens that an object is too big for Eden space, or if the Eden space is full, we can directly promote them into the heap, right? In the, uh, sorry, in the old generation, I always say heap. So it, that's premature promotion. So a collection of old generation is only when it fills up and that takes some time because the old generation usually is quite big. And so you can really uh, keep up, it's, it's more efficient that you keep up with high allocation rates, right? which is one of the advantages of doing generational GC in general. Okay, that was all very basic. Single threaded, we stop the world every time we do something. Now you know there's also concurrent collectors, which is a totally different beast. So how do that work? How does that work? So concurrency is hard, and if we now try to mark stuff concurrently, that means I collect data, right? I collect live objects. At the same time, the mutator starts allocating memory. So you, you might get the idea. It's not that, that easy. So we have the frame on the left where we have the GC root. Now, let's say the, G, the collector starts marking stuff, right? So it's, it, in the marking phase, it starts marking things, okay? First of all, it marks as reachable and then marked. And then it goes on and on and traverses the whole graph. So if we come to this position, so we already passed the first one, and suddenly the mutator decides, oh, you know what? I just removed this one reference and create a new one. Then what should the collector do? Because it passed that. For him, it wasn't really removed because he doesn't know. That means he continues collecting stuff and marking stuff. And at one point, it won't detect this one and will remove it, even if it's live now. And that's a problem, right? So we have to solve this kind of problems because suddenly the allocator and the collector are working at the same time on the heap, on the memory. Okay, how to solve that? Well, barriers to the rescue. There are write and read barriers that you can use. And... Um, a read and write barrier is a mechanism to execute code once you read or write memory. So that means there's some kind of a barrier where it's, as soon as you try to access the memory cell, you have to do something. If you're a write barrier, then it's always when you try to write, you have to execute some code. If it's read, then it's when you read or try to read the memory cell. So <clears throat> it's used to keep track. I showed you we have the different generations, right? So you can um, imagine that if you have a reference that's coming from the old generation back into the survivor space, and suddenly the survivor space moves because we copy everything over, suddenly the references are different, right? So, and we need to keep track of these references, the remapping phase, and for this kind of stuff, you need usually uh, write barriers. 
and also to synchronize between the mutator and the allocator. So the mutator uh, and the, the mutator is the allocator and the collector, so it's always confusing. So mutator means allocator, right? And collector is the garbage collector. And you have to synchronize between these two. Okay, read barriers, this just as a hint, are usually more expensive. And the reason for that is that you have way more memory reads than writes. And that means if you have a read barrier that will be executed every time you access the memory for reading, it has to be very efficient because otherwise the complete performance of your application will drop. Right? So that's, that's one thing you have to keep in mind. If we do that, same situation, garbage collector starts marking stuff and then it comes to this situation here. It, it establishes a write barrier on each memory cell. I just wrote it in this one. If now the uh, allocator starts and removes the reference, what this write barrier does is it just says, as soon as you remove a reference, mark it as reached, right? That's the idea behind it, behind the write barrier. And then the collector can just continue marking stuff. And one, once it's ready, there's a so-called remarking phase. And in this remarking phase, it will find this one reference there because now it's reachable and then it will mark it and then we are good to go, right? This is how it works with the barriers. So you have to establish barriers for writes as soon as the allocator starts writing to a memory cell and does something, in this case, removing a reference, we just mark the removed reference as still reachable. That's the idea. Okay, so that's also called snapshot at the beginning marking. All right, this is marking. Then if we do concurrent copying, that's a different thing. Because what happens is, if you have references that point to an object, which is on the left side, right? We are the from space. Now we need to copy that object. So what we usually do in the stop the world, we just stop the world. Now nobody can access the memory. Now I can just simply copy the whole object. Then I remap through a forwarding pointer in the object header. I remap all the references to the new one. And once I'm done, I can remove the stop and then just continue, right? Because that's safe. How to do that in a concurrent way? In this way, it would be, we have this object, we copy it, and in this moment, both objects are accessible to all kinds of threads. So that means suddenly, different threads can work on both copies, right? And they can write in both objects. So the problem is, which is now the right one? Which is the correct copy here? Hard to find out. So one solution to solve that is a so-called Brooks pointer that you can use, which is a, a pointer that is in the object header and it points to the header itself. So it doesn't make sense at all when you see it now. When I now copy this object, no, nothing will find this thing because the first thing is the forwarding pointer and it points to the object header, to the new one. So there's no reference here, which is nice because now what we can do, nobody knows about the new object, we can start and use the forwarding pointer in the old reference and then just point it to the new one and suddenly everything that happens on the old and the new will just end up in the new one. This is the idea behind the Brooks pointer. And with this strategy you can do concurrent copying because even if now a thread A accesses the old reference, the forwarding pointer will point to the new one and then it will just continue working on the right side instead of accessing the old reference. And then we can still update all the old references and once that is done, then we can remove the old reference. This is one thing you have to keep in mind, which is sometimes important. We have to keep the old object as long as not all the references are updated, right? Because there might be still references pointing to the old area in memory. So we need to update that stuff. And then we can remove it. Okay, this is concurrent copying. And now we know the basics to take a look at the collectors in the JVM because we have lots of collectors in the JVM. One question, is someone working with uh, OpenJ9, Semaru or something from IBM here? Because they, they have different collectors. They work similar, but they have different names. And these are only the collectors that are in OpenJDK. I guess most of you use OpenJDK-based distributions. So, serial collector, very simple one. Um, it's a lot of stuff. Like I said, I had so many slides, I have to compress it a little bit. Um, the important part is choose when and best suited for. With this thing, you have to know if you work on microservices that are really small, right, in your cloud environment, and really small, I mean memory below 1.8 gigabytes, or maybe just one CPU, 
you will get this collector, if you like it or not. You can try to select G1 on the command line. It won't take it. It will take this one. This is in the JVM. So be aware that if you use very small nodes with one CPU, it will always use the serial collector, which is not always a bad thing, right? So it's good for small single core systems with small heap. It's made for that, and it's not too bad. You have to think about you have lots of threads working on the application, then you stop it, then there's one thread doing the garbage collection, and then you just continue with your application, right? So this is how it works in general. It works on all operating systems, and you see the other facts there. And the session is recorded, so you can look it up later on if you have further questions. Parallel GC, it's another one, and the name says it already. Um, this is for multi-core systems, and to make it short, in principle, same idea with this, like with the serial one, but instead of just one thread doing the garbage collection, now all the threads doing that. And that means this is also known as the throughput collector. Throughput means the time that you spend in your application versus the time that you spend in garbage collection. And because if lots of threads working in parallel on garbage collection, the garbage collection time is quite small. And that are short, right? That means it is really high throughput, this collector, but the pauses are not really predictable. But it's very good for batch processing, scientific computing, data analysis, and these kind of things, right? So it, it de depends on your use case. So there is not this one collector for all. Right? This is the, one of the things you should take away from this session. Choose the right garbage collector for your application. Then there is CMS, which is deprecated already. It's not even in the JDK anymore. It was removed with JDK 14. This is concurrent mark and sweep. Remember, I showed you mark and sweep was the first one that we saw. That was the concurrent mark and sweep version. That means at the same time, partly. So it was not fully concurrent, just partially. And um, the response time is more uh, important than throughput. So this was not for throughput, but you would really like a snappy response in your application. And this was a really good collector to do that. If you still, uh, I think it was deprecated in JDK 9 and then removed in 14. Who's in JDK 11 here? 17? Okay, so everyone who's in 11 and below can still use it, but I wouldn't recommend it because we have another one that replaced this one. Um, it's available in, uh, since JDK 1.4. It's a really old uh, collector, and it did a quite good job, but had some problems sometimes. So, and for that reason, there came G1, which is garbage first. And this is the collector that you get today. If you don't do anything, you are more one than one CPU, more than 1.8 gigabytes, this is the default garbage collector that you get. So if you don't care about garbage collection, you probably use G1. And this is not a bad thing. And this collector is different than the others that we saw before, because now we don't have these big chunks of heap and, and survivor spaces. Now we divide the whole heap in, in so-called regions. And the regions depend on our heap size, as you can see on the left. Right? If I have a heap size of larger than 64 gigabytes, then you will get 32 megabyte regions here. And we, again, we have Eden Space, Survivor, Tenert, and Humongous. Humongous means this uh, object doesn't really fit in a half of the size of one region. So then it gets its own one, which is the Humongous one. How it works is we start allocating. We just say, this is now an Eden region, and this is random. Um, not really, but just let, keep it like that. Um, we fill them up. Right? We take more Eden space, and then at some point we run out of Eden space, right? because this is limited. As you can see, it's like 5 to 60 percent of the heap is a young generation in G1. So and if we take a look at it, then it will contain, you saw we have the purple objects, the dereferenced ones, so it will contain garbage. The Eden regions that contains the most garbage and the less amount of live objects. This will be collected first. This means garbage first, right? So we take these two regions, and then what we do is we evacuate them to a new one, which is now the survivor space, right? We just copy the live stuff in the survivor space, and then we can remove the Eden regions. And that goes on. So the, in the end, at some point, um, then, for example, if we fill up the survivor spaces and we have objects that live longer than the threshold, they will get in, into an inert space. So it's more or less the same that we saw before with the generational collector, but now it's just uh, divided in these regions. But the idea is the same. And then in the end, you end up with something like that. So it, it's really 
stuff is moving around. So the collector decides where it takes the regions and all these kinds of things. You also see the humongous uh, region down there. So that's a quite good collector. And um, this is if the response time is more important than the throughput. Again, this is very much the same than the CMS because this is more or less the replacement for CMS. Um, it, that's the reason why it has the same things. It's mixed workloads, large, large size enterprise systems. And I guess who's using G1 here or who knows who's using G1 in the audience? I guess a lot of people because, like I said, this is the default collector since JDK 8. So you will probably use it if you never care about garbage collection. Um, okay, then there's this one. Did someone ever heard about Epsilon GC? Because that's a very interesting garbage collector. Yeah, you probably. <laughs> this is a no garbage collector because it doesn't do garbage collection. So the question is, why do we have that one? And you can read it. So if you would like to test your application performance without having the garbage collector kicking in all the time, and you can't really control that, right? So then you can use the uh, Epsilon GC to figure the performance of your application. But you have to be careful with that one. Because as I said, there's no garbage collection. So you can define a heap size, and once it runs out of heap, you get out of memory exception. So that means you really need to know exactly how much memory you need in your application. Then you can use it. So that means if you have extremely short-lived jobs or you would really like to have the last drop latency improvements or throughput, you can use uh, Epsilon GC to do that. But you really need to know what you are doing because this is, it's not like, oh yeah, I use that, it's really fast because you really need to know and, and track your memory usage there. And this is, um, available everywhere in all these uh, OpenJDK builds. Okay, Shenandoah. This is uh, something that was developed by Red Hat, and this is a fully concurrent parallel um, collector, which is not generational yet. So there's things in the making. I'm not sure if it will be in 23 or not. I didn't see something right now. But at the moment, it's not generational, right? So it's just one generation that could have a de de uh, performance drop if you just have one generation. If you have uh, a generational GC, it's usually faster than a non-generational one. But still, this is a very good collector. So um, here, response time is really high pri priority. You can use very large heap sizes. It's more or less based. It uses a Brooks pointer that I showed you before and also a loaded value barrier uh, to do stuff, so which is a read barrier. Uh, lat latency sensitive applications will really benefit from that large scale systems. Um, it always, if we talk about concurrent GC, it always comes with a drop in performance. Might be just tiny, but you can imagine if you have 100 threads and they do all the stuff at the same time, or they do it just for your application and then for the garbage collection, there's a difference, right? So the performance you can measure, there is a drop in performance if you do concurrent garbage collection, that's for sure. Uh, I saw something from Netflix, they, they uh, switched to ZGC, which will be the next one, and I, I think they saw something about 3% in their application, a performance drop. It's not that much, but it is still there, right? So just keep that in mind. If you do concurrency, concurrent uh, GC, you will see drops in performance. It's not the same. Uh, this is not available in OpenJDK from Oracle, right? Uh, the reason is probably that Oracle doesn't like stuff that it doesn't invent, I don't know, but uh, this was done by Red Hat, so it's not part in the Oracle JDK, but all others have it, so it's in all builds of OpenJDK except the Oracle ones. Uh, ZGC, this is the zero garbage collector, and that is uh, uh, the newest one that we have in OpenJDK, and it's very similar to the G1 layout, so we have regions, we have an old generation, a young generation, so this is a g generational GC, and what, well, how it works is we have young generations, and when they age, so they survive uh, uh, garbage collection cycles, they will be uh, propagated to the old generation or promoted. And then in the end, it, it looks more like this. So it's very much the same as we saw in the G1 collector, but now we only have young and old. We don't have this uh, survivor spaces here. Uh, with this one, um, we just have five and a half seconds left, uh, half, 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 five and a half minutes left. So let me tell you a short story about that because I won't go into detail here because I will do it with the next one, which is the C4 collector that we invented. This is more or less the same as the C4 garbage collector. It's the exact same algorithm. 
and the C4 will be the next one. It's for very large heaps, around 16 terabytes, you can address with that one. Um, low latency sensitive applications, high throughput. This is just the, the best thing you can get at the moment if you really need high performance and low latency in garbage collection in OpenJDK. And there is, at the moment, you have, we have both. We have the non-generational ZGC and generational, uh, but the non-generational is already deprecated. So it will go away. And as far as I know, ZGC will become the next default uh, garbage collection, uh, garbage collector in OpenJDK in the future. So you see it's available on all these uh, operating systems. Um, it is for very uh, large heap sizes, pause times very short, latency very low. It has a CPU overhead. It's concurrent fully. So that means there is uh, at least a little bit of an overhead. And that leads me to the last one in the row, which is C4, right? Concurrent continuous compacting collector. This is one that we from Azul created uh, more than 10 years ago. And as I said, ZGC is this one. It's exactly the same. There's no difference. They're different names, but it works exactly the same. Except the generational one is a little bit different because uh, for the uh, generational one in ZGC, uh, the guys from OpenJDK implemented a write barrier somewhere, but we don't do that. So this is only available in Azul Zing, in our own JVM, and it makes only use of the loaded value barrier, which, which is similar to the one that is used in Shenandoah. That is a read barrier, but this one is, we had to make sure that it's really fast. And when I say test and jump, so what it does is um, we have the forward, oh, it's really hard to explain that. So if I, I told you about remapping, right? So we need to store the new position of the objects that, that we moved in the heap. We have to store it somewhere. So we don't store that on the object, we store that off heap somewhere, always in the same place, same as ZGC. And what we do then, if someone tries to access an object, it tests first, is that object reachable, right? And if yes, it does the jump. If not, it does something. This is the, the loaded value barrier. And the good thing is this is done in one CPU cycle, so it's really fast, right? So I told you, read barriers have to be fast, otherwise you run into problems. And you, this is also the same for ZGC. They really benefit from, if you run it on Linux, if you use transparent huge pages, right? If you really have huge pages, it's way faster than if you'd use the standard uh, memory pages in Linux. Okay, and just to explain the loaded value barrier shortly, so if we are the marking phase, right, we have the root objects on the left, the squares, and we have different garbage collection threads that go in concurrently on that and try to figure out the live objects. So they traverse through the graphs here and mark things with the M as marked. And now as, if suddenly an application threads allocates memory or tries to access memory, it has to trigger or it will trigger the LVB, the loaded value barrier. And in this case, it will do the test and jump and then we'll figure out, okay, that, that works and I will mark it. And that's the big difference here with this collector, CGC and C4. The allocator also marks objects. So that means not only the collector is marking stuff, but also the allocator. So they work hand in hand. What is the big advantage of that? The advantage is it hands it over to the GC after marking, and that means the GC doesn't have to mark it anymore. There's no remarking phase here. And that's the big advantage, right? So if the allocator also can mark objects, then it's like kind of self-healing stuff here, right? Um, last thing, if we remap objects, then I will just show you how this works. And this is, again, it's very much the same in ZGC. So on top is an, another collector, and in the bottom we see the, uh, the C4. We have references, and there are, is the loaded value barrier in between. And now if we copy objects to another place, what we have to do with the other ones is, now we have to have the forward pointer, have to update all the references, right? Because the forwarding information is in the object header. We save it off heap. So somewhere, which is not in the heap, it's always the same space. What's the big advantage here? Now we start relocating or remapping. And if now suddenly some application thread tries to access the old one, it's, it goes through the loaded value barrier, it does the test and jump and doesn't find it. So then it looks up the new one in the off heap page and corrects it directly. So it 
corrects the, the pointer. And that means there's no need, first of all, that the collector has to do it again. Again, the application thread is working hand in hand with the garbage collector. And on the other hand, because we don't save the forwarding information in the object header, we don't have to keep it. We can directly release the memory. Where the other one, the old or the other collectors, they have to keep the objects as long in the memory as there are not all the references are updated, right? Which is the difference here. Okay. Just shortly. Oh, we are out of time. I will be fast. <laughs> it's the same as EGC. We can handle up to 20 terabytes of, of heap. Low latency, sensitive applications. It's only available on Linux. We are working on a Mac version. Um, fully concurrent, generational, all the stuff. We don't have really the CPU overhead because in our JVM we have a different compiler which creates faster code. So that means the overall performance will be faster. And with this last question, which is the one to choose? We have a different criteria like throughput, latency, resource usage. Unfortunately, you can't just choose all of them. You have to make a choice, two out of three, if you choose a collector. If you would like to have very high throughput and very low latency, it's possible, but then you have not really low resource usage. Right? This is how it works. And um, I found this chart, which is quite nice. Um, it shows you if, you have, if the pause time has high priority, then probably C4, ZGC, or Shenandoah should be your garbage collector. If you need a good balance between uh, pause times and runtime overhead, then you should choose G1 or C, uh, CMC, CMS. And if the pause times are not really important, but the uh, CPU overhead, then parallel or serial are a good choice. I put all that stuff here. It is recorded. You can look it up. If you have questions, you can catch me outside. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Thank you so much.